That is uh, Del Casperson. He's one of our high school high schoolers. Actually, a high school senior just graduated, so a college freshman. He's going off to school this week. Can we thank God for that <laughs> gift? I don't know why I'm pausing. <laughs> I guess I'm kind of kind of thinking after that how to start. I guess I, I want to start by just acknowledging we're in Job part two. And, and there's a lot of ground we covered last week. I'm going to recap a little, little bit of that with you right now. Last week, we were introduced to a, a man named Job who was great. Uh, in fact, the greatest man in all of the East, the Bible uh, says. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. But beyond that, the Bible describes him as being blameless and upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil. Again, the greatest man of the East is, is what the Bible says. Now, as the story unfolds in chapter 1, the curtain of God's heavenly throne room is sort of drawn back so that we are allowed to peer in and overhear a conversation that takes place between Satan and the Lord God. And the Lord God begins simply like this. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on, in all of the earth, a, a man who fears God and turns away from evil. And in the ensuing conversation, the Lord God gives Satan the power to tempt and to try Job. So that by the end of this chapter that we read together last weekend, Job has lost everything in awful succession. There's this phrase out there that we're all somewhat familiar with, and it goes like this, what doesn't kill you makes you. Right, so you know that phrase. Maybe you've applied it to your own life, but I would suggest to you that that phrase has limits. It's not always true. Certainly not always true in every circumstance. We can learn lessons from challenging times, but they don't necessarily always leave us stronger. For example, there were plenty of people in 2008 watching the stock market crash on TV and with it their dreams for retirement, seeing their ability to keep employees on their payroll vanish before their eyes, and yet, as awful as it is to lose one's possessions, one's retirement, nothing, I'm told, absolutely nothing compares to the tragedy of losing one's child. But by the end of chapter 1, remember, Job has lost everything. He's lost all of his animals, all of his wealth, all of his possessions, and then in one fell swoop, literally, with a storm, with a windstorm, all ten of his kids. People who read the book of Job a lot, and I've known some who have read it 20 or 30 or even more times, they tend to read Job with that kind of intensity because they want to understand more about their own suffering and pain. Whether their loss is one of income or family or, or whether they found themselves being physically afflicted, as we're going to see in Job's life in just a moment, many people find it comforting to know that there are biblical heroes, if you will, of the faith that they can identify with, people that have suffered similarly. But as we progress today through our study of Job part two, we realize that Job's story is recorded in the Bible for us with another purpose in mind. And that purpose is really not to answer the question of suffering. You've maybe discovered this if you're one of those people who have read it multiple times. 
It's really not intended to answer that question of why is there suffering in this world, but rather its purpose and its placement in the scriptures is to enlighten us on the redemptive act of God's grace and to call us to repentance should we ever forget our place in the universe. I'd like to point out the central question in the book of Job. So if you grab your Bibles or your Bible app, you can turn now to Job 1 verse 9. Job chapter 1 verse 9 is a part of that heavenly throne room conversation where the Lord God begins by, by asking Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth. And in chapter 1 verse 9, Satan asks him right back, and this is the central question in all of the book. He asks, does Job fear God for no reason? Does Job fear God for no reason? He goes on, have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? In other words, Satan is asking God, why shouldn't Job fear love and trust in you above all things? Why shouldn't Job serve you? You have blessed him abundantly. You have given him this wealth, all of these possessions, all of these children. But reach out your hand against him, and he will curse you to your face. It's a direct challenge, you see. Satan wants to prove to God that you take this man who's righteous and blameless, nobody like him on earth, a man who fears God and shuns evil, but you start messing with his life. And we'll see what happens. I don't know about you, but I have to agree. It is easier to praise God when things are going great. When God's raining down blessings upon me and I'm basking in the sunlight of his grace, it's much easier to worship him, to praise him and acknowledge that he is good. But this central question that Satan poses makes us grapple with this. Can you praise him? Will you praise him even if tragedy strikes? Even if the mountains don't miraculously move out of your way? Even if God doesn't save you in that moment from that calamity, but lets it come, can you still worship him? That's the question. Can you still sense that he is holding on to you? Can you still understand and acknowledge that he is there and he is good even if you don't know the answer to the question why job can by god's grace job we see holds on to his integrity once job's own personal 9 11 happens you know what job does he tears his robe he shaves his head and he falls down in the dust heap and he worships God. Remember? Naked I came into this world, naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job knows his Redeemer lives. No matter what the circumstances of today are like, in the end, I will see him with my own eyes standing on the earth, no matter what. But Satan's not done. In fact, in the very next scene, which we didn't read, Satan, the accuser of mankind, comes back as part of that heavenly throne room conversation. He comes back and he says to the Lord God, skin for skin. It's a terrible, terrible statement and accusation. He says, all that a man has, he will give for his life, but you stretch out your hand, God, and you touch the person, and he will curse you to your face. It's another test. It's another trial. We're going to see, does Job fear serve God for nothing? And so God says to Satan, very well, he's in your hands. Only let the man live. 
And so Job is afflicted with terrible sores and boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. He suffers like, like no one we could ever imagine. I've seen a lot of suffering, and so have you. I've seen people break out in eczema all over their bodies, and the itching is so intense and the rash so terrible, they've had to be hospitalized. But for Job, there's no relief. There's no medication. There's no IV drip that can take it away. You know what Job has to do? He has to gather together broken pieces of pottery. And there as he sits in the dust and ash heap, he scrapes himself. His suffering is so intense that his wife tells him basically, get on with it, curse God and die. Three friends come to visit him from afar. They see him, and they don't even recognize the man. When they do recognize that it's Job, their friend, they begin to weep aloud, and they tear their clothes, and they sit down in the dust and ash heap with Job, and for seven days and nights, they don't say a word. None of them. They sit there in silence for a solid week. So great was their mourning. And then when they finally do speak, they do something unexpected out of friends. They begin to imagine what Job must have done that God would afflict him in this way. You see, their working theory is that God rewards obedience and punishes disobedience. Therefore, if Job is suffering in this way, Job, you must have committed atrocity. Job, you must be the most evil, vile person that ever lived. For God to reach out his hand against you like this, they accuse him of very many evils that he has committed against God. And so they prove themselves to be false and misinformed friends and truly terrible counselors. For a while, in fact, for 30 chapters, Job holds on to his God-given integrity. He just takes it. He takes what he's getting from God, saying, clinging to that faith, I know that my Redeemer lives. You know, even if he slays me, yet will I hope in him. For 30 chapters, but finally, their onslaught is so great that enough is enough. And the dam breaks. And Job, in, in our Bible reading today, right before that, begins to say why. You can imagine. What did I ever do to you, God? Job says, and I quote, If I had mistreated my servants... If I had lusted or walked in falsehood, if I had mistreated the poor, if I had trusted in gold or silver or delighted in my enemy's misfortune, but God, I haven't done any of that. I thought I was your friend. I thought you were pleased with me. I, I, I thought, but I cry out to you and you don't answer me. And in all of this justifying of himself, you see, Job forgot his place. He forgot who he was in relation to God. He starts calling God into question. He starts putting God on the defense. He, he's, he's doing all this and saying all this to God, trying to justify himself, and he forgets his place in the universe. And so God, it's God's turn now. God's turn now. Because he'll put up with false teaching only for so long. And he's put up with Job's nonsense now for a couple of chapters. And so God prepares to speak, but not as a, not as a kindly grandfather type figure, you know, with a long beard who's ready to give his beloved child a gift. Not even like a <clears throat> gurgling baby at Christmas time. No, when God speaks, his voice thunders out of the whirlwind. And for the next couple of chapters, God reminds Job of his place in the universe. He reminds Job that there are things that you will likely never understand. 
but it's also not your place to question my motivations, to put me on trial as if I were somehow unjust, as if I were somehow doing something wrong. He alone is God. And the question, remember, is not why do the good suffer? But the question is, will I trust him no matter what? Will I acknowledge that he is God? And that he's always in the right? Will I praise him even in dust and ashes? And the answer for you, in case you are curious, is yes. A resounding yes, you will. When you consider the cross, you will praise God. Even when you don't understand why troubles have come your way, you will praise God when you consider that on the cross, Jesus Christ bled and died for your sins and mine, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you and me to God. It is through what Jesus suffered unjustly that you and I have been redeemed. It's not the righteousness of your actions by which we are blessed. It's the righteousness of his actions by which we have temporal and eternal blessings. You see, Job was right when he earlier told his wife in those moments where he was holding on in his integrity. He was right when he said, shall I not accept bad from the Lord as well as good? He was right when he tells his friends, even though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job covers his face and he repents. Hearing God's voice thunder out of that whirlwind, he remembers who he is and who God is. And he repents in dust and ashes. To the best of our knowledge, Job never understood why any of this happened, but you know, he didn't have to either. He didn't have to understand. It didn't matter. We can ask why, but realize we may never understand. By the time we get to heaven, it won't even matter. God is God, and God is good. There are things that happen in this life we're not going to get. But look at the cross. That's what enables you to go on in trust and hold on in hope. Now, as the next part of this service unfolds, I want you to, I would invite you to think about all those bad headlines of your life, all of the suffering and pain that you've experienced. But as you do, also ponder this great truth. Your Redeemer lives. He is with you. He has not abandoned you, and you can trust in him.
powerful phrase in that song for me was this. I know you're able. I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, those words touch our hearts anew today because there are people in this sanctuary that are suffering, people that are unsure what tomorrow brings, that have doubts about their present moment, that are hurting, Lord. And yet today, we have been reminded that you are with us. In a little while, we're going to receive your Lord's Supper. The pledge of your presence with us. The reality of your presence with us. Forgive us for the times that we doubt you. And help us to worship you no matter what. Help us to trust in you and in your goodness that you've shown us already. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Father, for your great love, your care for Job and for all your children today. We pray it in your most holy and precious name. And together, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.